Thank you. We've eaten to some, into some of the time for understandable reasons uh, in this statement, so I beg your pardon, point of order, Mr Crawford. Understandably, the, the, the last um, session ran over what was, I think was expected it to be in terms of the statement and the questions. Can you give me a, um, a, an estimated time of when this particular se uh, session might finish uh, so that we can uh, make appropriate arrangements? Uh, yes, uh, it's very kind of you. It's not either point of order because control of the debate is in my hands. However, I am prepared to tell you, because I'm that kind of person, that we have about eight minutes in hand. But I don't want you to abuse that. Now, you see, I shouldn't have told you, Mr. Mountain. I can already see you're lengthening your question. Uh, uh, this is a statement from uh, Minister Marie Goujon uh, on supporting sheep farming in Scotland. The minister will take questions at the end of her statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call in Marie Goujon. Minister, 10 minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, presiding officer, there can be few more resonant sites in the Scottish countryside than spring lambs. And thankfully, this year, the weather has been much kinder to our hardworking sheep farmers, crofters and shepherds. Most would acknowledge that this has allowed for a good lambing season. We have a lot of sheep in Scotland, around 2.6 million of breeding ewes on 13,000 holdings. In total, there are around 24,500 farms, crofts and small holdings now with sheep. Of course, the concept of sheep on our hills was once controversial. But ironically, they now help us keep people on the land, with many farms and crofts using land to rear sheep that isn't productive for other purposes. We're also seeing a more diverse sector, with more traditional and native breeds making a comeback. And if anyone has watched This Farming Life, we've seen completely new breeds to Scotland beginning to feature. As the Cabinet Secretary has just said, all sectors will have a role to play in addressing the climate emergency. And farming is no exception to that. The sheep sector is already doing so with its grazing systems that produce high quality meat with low inputs. But we must go further and faster. And I will fully involve the sector to develop new tools and production methods to better address climate change. Working with farmers to make change happen is crucial and underpins how we've taken forward the key recommendations for government from the Scott Review of Sheep. Our approach to traceability and provenance is key to this. We have introduced electronic tagging to create a robust recording and traceability system through markets and abattoirs. The data is held in the Scott EID electronic system, which allows keepers to maintain their own information. This also makes compliance with the necessary sheep tracing legislation easier. The effectiveness of this system enabled the Scottish Government to win a dispensation from the European Commission to allow for incomplete reads to be acceptable in the CAP cross-compliance regime. And that represented a significant win for Scotland. The European Commission is now proposing to change the rules through a new animal health regulation. The proposed changes would have been difficult for the particular circumstances of our sheep sector which can often involve movements during a sheep's lifetime within Scotland and across the UK, from birth to fattening to finishing. There has therefore been a significant period of engagement with the European Commission to make the case for our current excellent sheep traceability system in Scotland to continue. I corresponded and met with Commissioner Andrew Kytus and Scottish officials worked closely with UK government counterparts to secure their support as well. In particular, I want to thank MEPs Alan Smith and Catherine Styler for their work alongside key stakeholder bodies on this issue. The Commission's consultation is now live and I would strongly urge Scotland's sheep farmers and crofters to respond. They need to make their views known in support of the current wording of the new regulation. Last year, the Scottish Government supported the sector's efforts to persuade the EU to introduce an allowance for alternative methods of ageing of lambs for the purposes of removal of specified risk material, a key control for BSE. The new method would have removed the need for manual dentition checks on lambs, replacing it with a much simpler date-based cut-off, saving the industry in Scotland and across Great Britain millions of pounds. The Scottish Government and Food Standards Scotland worked with industry to develop an implementation plan and protocol it would have given effect to a key recommendation of the Scott Review, so we amended legislation and were preparing to go ahead. However, as a result of Brexit uncertainty, the UK Government did not want this change to go ahead. 
it was concerned that continuing to argue for a differential position for Scotland and GB would impact adversely on the UK's application for third country status. In short, presiding officer, our sheep farming sector in Scotland was seen as expendable. We've continued to press this issue, but DEFRA recently determined it could not prioritise this, as we have in Scotland. Nor could we go it alone, given that would mean Scottish sheep farmers would be subject to different systems across the UK, adding complexity that would make sales in other parts of the UK impossible. Therefore, I have reluctantly agreed that we shall not be proceeding with this change until next year. Of course, none of the everyday challenges of sheep farming compare to the overwhelming risk that Brexit represents. The reckless attitude of the UK government and its failure to take no deal off the table threatens to make the export trade in sheep meat completely unviable. We may now have a stay of execution until the 31st of October, but a no deal remains a very real risk. No deal would result in our lamb exports being subject to the EU's full most favoured nation tariffs of 40% or more. This increases the price for EU markets and has the potential for domestic prices to fall by around 30% and reduces competitiveness. So officials across the UK continue to work on a pros proposed compensation scheme for the sheep sector to address the potential fallout. And our preferred option is a headage scheme. And while we welcome undertakings by Michael Gove that the UK government will pay all the costs arising from a no-deal Brexit, the UK government must now make clear how much money it will make available for a compensation scheme. The best option, of course, is for our sheep sector to be able to sell their product. So we continue to explore how to keep markets open and grow new ones. More people in Scotland and the UK are buy buying Scotch lamb would help. Last year, we gave Quality Meat Scotland £200,000 to support its campaign to promote Scotch lamb. The impact was significant, with a 27% increase in spend per buyer on lamb during that promotional period. We want to build on that success. So I can announce today that this government will provide Quality Meat Scotland with an additional £200,000 to support marketing activity in the coming year to help it continue to promote Scotch lamb to people here at home. Additionally, after years of pressing, we've persuaded the UK government to repatriate the meat levy. Amendments have been made to the UK Agriculture Bill to allow this to happen. But to get the UK scheme established, it is vital that this bill makes progress at Westminster. It's been parked for months now. With the help of key stakeholder bodies whose input was vital, we will help deliver an additional £1.5 million supporting our quality meat sector, including Scotch lamb. So I want to deliver a clear message to Michael Gove. Get on with it. Protecting livelihoods is also one of the reasons why we're supporting efforts to address livestock worrying and predation. Reports of attacks are increasing. And those of you who have seen photographs in the press and recently on social media will have, no doubt have been as shocked as me. I'm fully supportive of Emma Harper's proposed bill to update the law on this issue. We have also commissioned research to gather more evidence of the scale of the problem and explore the impact on animals, but also on farmers, their families and their businesses. And we continue to support campaigns by Spark and NFU Scotland to raise awareness and encourage more responsible dog control in areas where there is livestock. As we saw from the terrible impact of Beasts from the East last year on lambing and the toll that took on farmers, families and communities, climate and landscape are key components to successful sheep farming. That is why we established the Sheep and Trees Initiative in 2016 to provide support to improve the productivity of hill farming enterprises. Trees planted in the right place can provide important shelter and extend outwintering, thus improving productivity while maintaining flock size on a reduced grazing area. The initiative is working. Since 2016, over 400 crofters and farmers across Scotland have been awarded £70 million in forestry grants to help them to integrate new woodlands into their farming enterprises. And while over 80% of applicants for grants to create more woodlands are now from farmers and crofters, the role of agroforestry and diversified and low carbon land use will only increase as we respond to the climate emergency. We will support the sheep sector to play its part, as we do already through cap payments. Many sheep farmers will have benefited from this year's loan schemes. The LFAS scheme in particular made sure farmers and crofters got additional support in early spring. 
In April, we started making the 2018 Elfast payments. And I can advise that next week, a further tranche of payments worth approximately £15 million will begin to arrive in bank accounts. Around 2,600 farmers and crofters will receive money, meaning nearly 8,100 will have been paid since April, with over £39 million directly supporting remote, rural and island communities. Presiding officer, only Scotland provides this additional help to our most marginalised farmers and crofters, many of them in the sheep sector. This government remains absolutely committed to getting financial help to those who need that help the most. We value the significant contribution that Scotland's sheep sector makes, not just to the rural economy, but also to our landscape, our culture and our heritage. Brexit threatens to remove the sheep from our hills and people from our land, and we cannot let that happen. So I want to assure everyone in Scotland's sheep sector that this government will continue to support you. We will always stand up for your interests and we will keep making the case for Scotland to stay in the EU as the best way to protect those interests. Now, thank you very much, Minister. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in the statement. I intend to allow about 20 minutes for questions and the answers, after which we move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if those members who wish to ask a question were to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Donald Cameron to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Mr Cameron. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Minister for early sight of her statement and also refer to farming and crofting in my register of interest. We, of course, welcome and share the general statement of support for sheep farming this afternoon. Given that sector's critical role in Scottish agriculture, though the statement itself was not without some moments of hysteria, to claim the UK government views sheep farming as expendable must count as one of the, must count as one of the wilder claims mm. made by the government in this chamber and flies in the face of the support that Michael Gove and others have made in support of upland farming in Scotland. Given the government's cap payment fiasco and the cuts to Elfast, which it continues to administer, it is pretty rank hypocrisy to accuse others of failing to support sheep farming. The Scottish Conservatives readily acknowledge that as a sector, agriculture requires to reduce its emissions to combat climate change. Farmers and crofters understand better than anyone else the importance of farming in an environmental and efficient manner. We believe that a long-term transition must be undertaken in a way which is fair and just, with farmers seen as the solution, not the problem. Many farmers, sheep farmers, will have read with some anxiety the report of the Climate Change Committee and its references to eating less beef and lamb in our diets and reducing our consumption of these products. And given these references and the Scottish Government's new commitment to net zero emissions by 2045, what reassurances can the Minister give to Scotland's sheep producers that they will not be expendable? Minister. Uh, in relation to the second part of the uh, comment from Donald Cameron, I mean, we certainly do not see, of course, farmers are part of the solution and they're the custodians of the land. And it's vitally important that we work with them. And in the Cabinet Secretary's previous statement on the, the climate emergency, she outlined a number of projects and I visited a, a whole variety of different initiatives where we're actually looking at, well, what we can actually do to, to tackle climate change and to implement activities that, will, that can be replicated across Scotland. I visited one just recently um, with the farming, uh, farming for a Better Climate, which was about soil regeneration, and that was with farm, five farmers in the northeast uh, who have a variety of different farms. And of course, that knowledge and what we see developed from that will be vitally important to, to other farmers uh, across Scotland. But I also have to address the very first point that you made about the, the Elfast payments and the cuts to Elfast. I think that's, that's rich coming from the Tories and coming from Donald Cameron, when that's something that in Scotland we've protected. They've done away with them in the rest of the UK and we have protected that as far as we possibly can so I, I, I absolutely take umbrage with that comment and it's completely false to say that we've uh, overseen cuts to Elfast when we've done the exact opposite and put our, we've made Elfast a priority and a priority of this government and protecting those payments as far as we possibly can. Thank you I call Rhoda Grant to be followed by Alistair Allen. Ms Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Our farmers and crofters need stability and simplicity to enable them to plan ahead. A new subsidy regime must be in place as soon as possible to give the industry a stable basis on which to innovate, to tackle the challenges of climate change and to meet our new targets. Can I ask the Minister, when will the new group of rural advisors come forward with a blueprint for a new regime in order that our farmers and crofters can meet their new targets? And while we're talking of stability, it would also be helpful to know when Elfast will be paid at 100% rather than the 80% that is currently being paid. Minister. 
Uh, I thank Rhoda Grant for raising those points and I know that the Cabinet Secretary had updated the, the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee on a number of these issues at his uh, appearance a, a few years ago, especially in relation to the uh, looking at the, the commitments for the Elfast payments and w the work that we're trying to do to try and yeah, to really work on that and find a solution for it. Um, but I would say that also in relation to stability and simplicity that, that Rhoda Grant talks about, I mean, that was the key fix the key piece of our, our policy going forward because at least for the next five years that's exactly what we want to provide to, to farmers and to rural Scotland uh, having that stability and knowing what they can expect for the next five years and that's we have more detailed plans there than exist across the rest of the UK and I think it's vitally important to remember that and I think there was also a, a point there about the new group will be established again I think the cabinet secretary referred to that in his committee appearance too obviously we're keen to establish that group and to get that going because uh, we do recognise that of course we need to look beyond we have the policy set for the next five years we need to start considering that and that was a, an agreement that was made in this parliament uh, when we had the debate in January and again fairly recently so work on that is progressing. Alistair Allen followed by Peter Chapman Mr Allen. Um, it is really disappointing to hear that the United Kingdom government did not support moving from the unwieldy dentition method of ageing lambs to age cutoff as the sheep sector in Scotland wanted. Can I ask how the UK government arrived at its position, what influenced its thinking, and whether the Scottish government and other devolved administrations were consulted in any meaningful way before DEFRA announced its decision? Minister. I would thank the member for raising that point because this was, abs it was a key recommendation that actually came out of the Scottish Sheep, sheep Sector Review in terms of driving abattoir profitability. Um, but I would say that it was definitely the uncertainty around Brexit that was the key factor in the UK government failing to take forward that proposal. Uh, because I would say probably like most things that are Brexit related, the UK government coordination with other devolved administrations on the proposal has been very challenging. On the 4th of March, we were advised by DEFRA that they wanted to postpone it. Uh, the response they got from ourselves and the other devolved administrations and indeed the stakeholders showed that that wasn't going to be a popular move and indeed would have been the wrong decision. And on that basis, both myself and my Welsh counterpart wrote to Lord Gardner, who is the responsible UK minister. Uh, there was then some limited engagement before DEFRA took the final decision to postpone on the 29th of April. And clearly, Scotland's voice and interests weren't listened to uh, and our needs weren't taken, to, uh, taken into account. Um, and I would say that when when it comes down to making decisions, the UK government rarely, if ever, puts Scotland's needs and interests first. Thank you. Before I, I call Peter Chapman, I have 11 members uh, wishing to ask questions and even giving you additional time. That's going to be very difficult. So I want straight to questions, Mr Chapman, not preambles, and that goes for everybody who follows. Mr Chapman. Elfast payments are due to be cut by 20% this year and 60% next year. The Cabinet Secretary has repeatedly stated that he will limit the cuts to 20%. Excuse me. But we have seen no, that's called, progress. No, that's called a preamble. Question, please. Is this another worthless SNP promise? Or can the Minister give us any reassurance today that any progress has been made Thank in you. mitigating Thank these Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Cuts? Minister, sit down, please. Yeah. Minister. I would just respond by saying that's simply not the case and I know that the member will be aware the cabinet secretary said as much when he appeared in front of the committee a couple of weeks ago and committed to it was 80 percent this year and we're committed to finding a solution and you won't find anyone else across the rest of the UK that's as committed to funding this and looking at Elfast in the way that we have yeah. and making it a yeah. priority in the way yeah. that we have. Absolutely. Maureen Watt followed by Claudia Beamish. Ms. Watt. Um, thank you. Um, the, the climate change plan suggests that practices such as traditional livestock grazing or reducing the need for synthetic fertiliser, etc., can help car carbon storage. Can the Minister tell us what is being done to promote a positive vision of how farming can benefit and benefit from the need to address climate change? For is it really a neither or sheep Thank or you. butterflies Thank on you. Thank you. I've had your question. Hills? I'm trying to keep them short for everybody. Minister. 
So I know that my, my colleague there was referring to the rather flippant comment that was made by Andrea Leadsom about when it came to, to sheep and butterflies and would say that uh, in Scotland that's definitely not the, the choice that we'd see. I mean, I, there are a, a whole wide variety of initiatives that we're looking at. I outlined some of those earlier in terms of soil regeneration, but we also have some other vitally important projects that are underway. We have our climate change champions and I reference this Farming Life, the programme uh, that, uh, that aired uh, on BBC just a, a few weeks ago, where we had Lynn and Sandra from Lynn Brett Croft and looking at the practices that they're implementing on their croft near Granton on Spey. Bryce Cunningham at Mosgiel Farm as well, and how he's what the work that he's trying to do with his soils and with his dairy herd. So from all these projects, we can take a whole wide variety of things and policies that can hopefully uh, lead by example and replicate that in other areas. Thank you, but I could do with a bit of cooperation Sorry. as well. I appreciate this is an important debate, but cooperation all round. I've got Claudia Beamish to be followed by Stuart Stevenson, Ms Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister confirm whether she would be willing to commit to developing a standardised carbon audit process to be used by farmers across all Scotland, recognising their future contribution? Thank you, Ms Beamish. That was spectacularly right. Minister. <laughs> I, 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 would I would consider that and I'd be happy to meet with the member to discuss, to discuss that further. Stuart Stevenson, followed by John Finney. Uh, can the government help protect uh, lamb exports to the EU, in particular uh, through speedy export health certification, uh, as it's uh, important when we leave the single market and customs union as the UK wishes to? Minister. When we thought that we were facing the prospect of uh, a no deal Brexit just last month, that was export health cert certification was one of the key issues that was identified by the sector and one that we were uh, trying to find a key priority and one that we were trying to find a solution to. And uh, to deal with that, uh, my officials have been working with the Animal and Plant Health Agency and with local authorities to ensure that there will be adequate certification provision in the event of a no deal. And as part of that, APHA have been investigating the potential to introduce flexibility and efficiency through the introduction of certification support officers who can facilitate the signing of export health certificates. Thank you, Thank you very much, John Finney. We're followed by Mike Rumbles. Thank you, President Officer. Minister, you say Brexit, Brexit threatens to remove sheep from our hills and people from our land. What steps are the government and you and your colleagues taking, not simply to sustain populations in rural pop, uh, communities, but to increase populations? Minister. Oh, I thank the member for raising that vitally important point and I had a meeting with the Minister for Europe and Migration, Ben McPherson, to discuss exactly that because I think that that's another uh, big fear and another big obstacle and challenge that we face in light of Brexit and the potential changes to immigration that we could see that will do untold amount of damage to people in Scotland and particularly to our rural areas that will be set to suffer the most. So this is something that is very much on our minds and something that we are looking to discuss because we want to see people living and working in rural areas. We need people living and working in rural areas and we'll do everything we can to make that happen. Mike Rumbles followed by Emma Harper. Could the Minister confirm whether or not sheep farming interests will be represented on the group the Government is convening that will recommend a new bespoke system of support for Scotland for the post-Brexit years if indeed Brexit actually happens? Thank you Mr Rumbles. Minister. Yes. Emma Harper to be followed by Edron Mountain. Will the Minister commit to hearing feedback from my livestock attacks by dogs consultation which ends tomorrow and will she be open to working with me to create a piece of legislation to protect her farmers from such an emotional and costly experience? Minister. Well, first of all, I just want to offer my thanks, my personal thanks, and uh, that of the Scottish Government as well to Emma Harper for taking forward what is such an important issue and such an important bill. And I really look forward to hearing more about the, the feedback that Emma Harper has received <coughs> through her consultation, which I believe has received uh, quite a large, uh, I think maybe about seven or 800 responses so far. Uh, we've all seen recently, particularly pictures in the media, pictures in social media, about the, about the damaging effects that, that livestock worry causes not just to animals but to the farmers and their families and businesses as well so I'm happy to work with Emma Harper on her bill as she develops that. Thank you Edwin Mountain to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Thank you presiding officer and I refer members to my register of interest uh, in a farming partnership. I'm disappointed the minister is telling Michael Gove to get on with his bill when they aren't getting on with theirs. When will the Scottish pub, uh, government 
publish their two agriculture bills. Minister. Again, that's simply not the case. And I know that this is the issue... The issue of the bills was discussed at the, the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee as well by the Cabinet Secretary where he updated the committee members on the situation with the bills which would be making uh, technical changes when they do come forward. And that's where I think that we have, there are elements within the UK Agricultural Bill, uh, we have the devolved administration meetings every month where we have been pushing every month to see what the timetable is for that legislation there, where we see vitally important things like the red meat levy, which we could make a massive impact in Scotland but we get no idea on time scales and no idea when that's coming forward. And when it comes to direction and what we are doing, we have far more detailed plans in Scotland than what they exist anywhere else in the UK. Yeah. Colin Smith, uh, Colin Smith, we followed by, I beg your pardon, Ruth Crawford, we followed by Colin Smith. Mr Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Officer. Given that Michael Gove is in the air, does the Minister agree with me that it's shameful that Michael Gove, the UK Environment Secretary, has shafted Scottish hill farmers on the matter of... Can of, on the matter of convergency money. EU convergency money of £160 million and triggered only because thank you. of raw rates of paid to the Scottish health farmers. Thank you, Minister. Well, I couldn't agree more with that because the only, the only reason we received that money in the first place was because of the farmers and the crofters in Scotland. And what did the UK government do with that money? They spent it everywhere else but here. Yeah. And the Tories have the cheek to talk about Elfast payments. Well, guess what? The convergence monies could have gone a long way to help support in our sheep and hill farmers if we were able to get that back. And that's why this review is so vitally important because that was a massive injustice that was done to Scotland and to Scottish hill farmers years ago where they took this decision and to shaft us on £160 million worth of funding. So we want to see that money returned to Scotland and for it to go to the place where it's needed and that's with the Scottish and farmers and crofters who were the only reason we got that in the first place. Uh, can, I, can I say to both members, not happy with that word, terribly happy with it. Uh, that's to Mr Crawford and the Minister. Uh, it's, just, it's for me to decide if I'm not happy with it and I'm not happy with it. Um, I call Colin Smith, we follow by Finlay Carson. Thank Mr. you, President Officer. Without legislation by 2020, farmers and crofters face a potential cliff edge when it comes to rural payments. So will the Minister at least tell members when the Government will publish the specific rural support legislation required to provide future payments? Minister. That legislation will be brought forward when, when we require it and when that needs to be done. But I mean, when it, when it comes to a no-deal Brexit, there isn't, we would still be able to, to pay farmers and pay them the payments that they're due anyway. So that isn't a risk for us at the moment. That's right, exactly. And lastly, Finlay Carson. Culture and heritage. Uh, in light of SNH's decision to remove sheep from Dromore Farm in my constituency, what will her government do to protect the hefted sheep flocks and traditional hill farms in the south of Scotland? Because once they're gone, they're gone. Minister. I don't know about that specific instance that Finlay Carson raises, but this is an issue, again, I would be happy to meet with them to discuss that. And that concludes questions. Can I thank all members because we've got to move on. We've got everybody in, including a latecomer, Mr Carson. So there you are. And uh, we're now going to move on to the next item of business. So I'll pause for a few moments and we move on.